So, and from now we're at recording the meeting. If everybody knows. Go ahead, uh, Valid. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Lawrence. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, my presentation today is titled How Would Real Time Electricity Pricing Affect the Saudi Power System in Saudi Arabia in, in the long run? Um, this is the last paper of many that looked at uh, the idea of embedding households in building energy models. And, and in this paper, I link the residential uh, electricity use framework to uh, an energy system model. So the, the motivation behind this um, uh, begins by the fact the Saudi government completed um, an electricity electricity's, uh, meter uh, replacement uh, program last year for the residential sector. Um, this program cost uh, about 9 billion rials, uh, Saudi rials, or $2.4 billion. So they replaced about um, 6 million meters in the kingdom. Uh, this, so in addition to the benefits of gaining more information, more control to this uh, local utility, this will also allow uh, the local regulator to impose uh, dynamic pricing or hourly pricing of some sort. So in the past, I looked at time of use pricing, um, different uh, dynamic prices. In this paper, I looked at, I looked at electricity, uh, I looked at real-time pricing, which is determined by uh, the energy system model. So empirical estimates um, in the literature um, of the own price elasticity may not be policy relevant. Um, and in fact, they, 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 they are not for, for this region, for, for, for my region, which is the Gulf Cooperation Council, because we've had uh, very low electricity prices, uh, electricity prices have not varied very often. And so um, Atala, Atala and Hunt, for example, found that residential um, price elasticities um, were zero for several countries in the GCC. Um, and furthermore, most elasticities are for annual electricity use. Um, whereas in this study, we look at um, how the household respond depending on season, uh, not just uh, annually. So the elasticities differ by season. Uh, the method that is presented um, in the following slides endogenizes energy efficiency investment and conservation decisions. And so if you change the price on households, the, the idea of the method is to tell you how they would respond uh, by varying behavior, behavioral response, by, be, by varying energy efficiency purchase decisions. And so electricity price elasticities themselves uh, are implicit. Um, in, in, our method, in our method. So the residential electricity use model, uh, as I said, is linked to, to an energy system model. Um, for the first component, the residential electricity use model, uh, electricity consumption um, is found by a building energy model. So a physical, a physics-based building energy model tells you what the electricity use is, how much the electricity expenditure was for that electricity use. And this model adheres to um, physical laws like the conservation of energy, conservation of mass uh, that, that govern how the energy flows inside and outside of a house and within a house, within a dwelling. Uh, the household decision making is, govern is found by um, a utility maximization, maximization component um, which is a standard, um, very simple. Uh, so you, you can make this as complex as possible. You can, you can have it be as simple as possible. Uh, in this example, in, th in this paper, um, I utilize a simple uh, CES um, utility function. And that, th that is constrained by a budget constraint. Um, so the budget constraint is, uh, the, the, is, is income uh, basically equaling uh, the energy efficiency in purchase plus all the other expenditures that household experiences. 
So expenditures on energy, expenditures on, um, on other goods and services. And the energy investment in this particular analysis is annualized um, uh, annualized investment. So, it's, so in this paper, we, we, we run for a single year that is, that, that is approximating a long run uh, year. Uh, so the model solves for a wide range of options. Uh, so behavioral investment op uh, behavioral decisions and energy investment uh, options and, and determines the combination of, of them uh, that maximizes the household utility based on a, a price that we input to the model. So either a time of use price, a real time price, a seasonal price, and or, or even a, a non dynamic price like um, a static price like uh, progressive tariffs or, or flat tariffs. So the energy system model, because uh, we, we have to find the, um, the marginal cost of generation since they will define uh, the real-time prices, um, is, uh, is the Capstock energy model. So um, the Capstock energy model is a multi-sector equilibrium model uh, for the energy and energy intensive industries in, in Saudi Arabia. And in this model, uh, as opposed to others like TIMES and, and uh, um, NEMS and other energy system models out there is, uh, is an equilibrium model. So it, it, it's, it's formally is, is, an, is an MCP as opposed to a linear program. So each sector uh, has, a, has, has, has its own objective function. So water desalination, for example, minimizes costs, petrochemicals, cement, and oil, oil refinery since they can export uh, they maximize profit uh, and electricity sector, which is the uh, the focus in this paper, um, is a cost minimizing agent. So the reason we formulated this as an MCP uh, is because linear programs um, have the implicit assumption that the transfer prices equal to the equal the marginal costs, and so in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the fuel and energy prices are oftentimes not close to the marginal costs of production. Um, they're, they're administered by the government. There's a, there, there's a fixed price uh, for oil, for, 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 um, for gas, for example. And so we, we developed this uh, method uh, because of that. So the power sector in particular is, as I said, cost minimizing. Um, it uh, comprises existing and prospective technologies like PV and, and wind turbines and, and even nuclear. Uh, we have 24 chron chronological load curves uh, for each region. So we have uh, uh, for each region and season. Um, for, so we have four regions. We, we break up Saudi Arabia into four regions to account for the climate differences between the, the various regions. And, uh, and we have three seasons, uh, seasonal periods. So we have summer, summer uh, spring and fall together, and uh, winter. Uh, so we have, and we also have eight load segments. So we, br we break the, the hourly, the, 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 uh, the daily load curve into eight load segments to, uh, to make sure the model is tractable. In terms of assumptions, uh, we've calibrated the model to 2016 to 2017. It's, it's, it's not very, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not clear as to whether the model, uh, the, the data is for 2016 only or 2017 only, uh, because we used, because uh, uh, in data collection, the, uh, the, the statistical authority uses the Higgity count, uh, the, lunar, the lunar year as opposed to the Gregorian year. Uh, however, uh, capital uh, operational costs of the prospective technologies and the existing technologies are as they were in 2016 and 2017. Uh, the model is run for a hypo hypothetical scenario um, in which fuel prices are liberalized. Uh, so um, all the results shown in the next slides will, will be uh, of a scenario that uh, that has oil prices equaling the international market price. Um, and natural gas is, is, a domestic clearing, is a domestic price equaling the domestic marginal value of demand. So because we, we, don't, have, we don't trade gas, so there isn't a way to price uh, internationally where that gas would be. 
Um, we have we, we run two scenarios uh, for 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 the, uh, for the electricity price. Uh, one where we impose the 2017 price of electricity for households. Uh, so this was a, a progressive uh, pricing structure, as, as I show here. So for, so below two megawatt hours, for example, the price we, uh, the price was 1.33 cents. Oh yeah, per kilowatt hour. Uh, the real time prices are determined by the model. And, and uh, I forgot to mention, uh, so the residential framework and the, and the energy system model are run iter iteratively because uh, the marginal costs obviously will change as you change prices on households. So until the, those, until the marginal cost, uh, until the prices that households pay, the marginal costs of generators and the demand of households converge, we iterate. Um, to do that. Uh, RTP is only applied to households in, in this paper. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't presume that you know, RTP will only be applied to households. It's just that in this paper, we, we only apply, apply it to households. Um, as, as I show here, about 50% of, um, of electricity use went to the household sector in Saudi Arabia. All right, so we have this set of behavioral demand response measures and energy efficiency uh, purchase decisions or cases uh, or options uh, that the model may choose uh, from. Uh, so we have higher air, air conditioning efficiency, uh, reduced infiltration, uh, high, uh, low E windows, uh, thermal insulation, LED adoption, and a combination of several of them. And for behavioral response, I focused on uh, the air conditioning adjustment, air conditioning thermostat adjustment uh, in, in the summer, spring, and fall, and an additional uh, flexibility given to the households uh, for the peak periods in the summer, which is from 12 o'clock uh, to, uh, to 4 p.m. Uh, we also have turning off lights uh, so the, the household can, can, can actively uh, adjust how much lighting they have in the house, and also appliance load sh shifting. So the household can also, so for example, in, in the case where the household can, can have a higher price in, this, in the, um, in, during the daytime, they can shift some of their appliance loads uh, to the night. But if you so have past papers, I'm sorry. But, sorry, you have about five minutes. All right. So the past, the past papers looked at, um, uh, the household's effects. So they look, look at the, the utility, the, the welfare effects on the households, uh, the effects of uh, the indirect rebound, um, the uh, effects of, of subsidy, if, if, if the government were to, to subsidize energy efficiency, for example. Um, and so those people looked, looked at the, the household side of the equation. Um, this paper will focus on the power generator um, in, in comparison. All right, so for fuel use uh, in 2018, uh, we used a, a mix of gas uh, in Saudi Arabia. We, we used a mix of gas, oil, um, crude and fuel oil and diesel. Um, now, when you liberalize fuel prices, oil becomes too expensive to, to, to use um, and therefore it, it goes away. And, and for the and for any demand that can't be satisfied with with, ga with gas, um, you you build PV uh, plants to, to meet this to, to, to meet the, the demand. And so, here we show the investment uh, by, by by the power sector in a liberalized fuel pricing scenario with and without RTP, and uh, with RTP in place. Um, the sector forgoes 16 gigawatts of solar PV capacity in the long run. Um, so the effective marginal costs of generation, um, of electricity generation, uh, with and without RTP, I think um, there are two main takeaways here. Uh, one is that there's less very variability with, with RTP in place, in this, in this, especially in the winter. You know, in the winter, it can, it can go down, go down to zero or near zero marginal cost because you have all those, all that PV invested 
uh, all that PV operating in the summer and you have lower loads in the winter because it's cooler and all that PV is, is, meeting, is meeting all the load. There, there's no need to use uh, fuel-based power generation in, in, in the daytime uh, in, the, in the winter. And so there, there's less variability in the marginal costs. Um, for example, in the summer, it goes from 100, from about $100 a megawatt hour to 200 um, without, 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 without RTP. With RTP, uh, it goes from about uh, $75 a megawatt hour to 150 So there's less variability, uh, as I said, especially in the winter. And so to summarize, um, real-time electricity prices would uh, dampen the variability in the long run marginal cost um, throughout the day, especially in the winter, um, reduce the marginal costs of generation at night uh, when, when, when fuel-based generation would have to operate, uh, reduce capital expenditures in, to, to, to the power system, for the power system, uh, and also natural gas use would not be affected all, at all. It only affects the incremental uh, demand uh, that is met by um, technologies beyond natural gas, uh, fire ge generation. Uh, capital expenditures in the, in, the, in the power sector dropped by $24 billion in total investment costs. Uh, and, and just, just, just to, 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 to remind the uh, audience, the cost of the PP, of the meter replacement program was twenty was two point four billion, so ten times less. Um, and so the the sector enjoys uh, um, much lower capital expenses than they spent on uh, the uh, through, through RTP uh, than they spent on the the meter the meter replacement program that that allowed them to implement RTP pricing. Thank you. All right, thank you, Walid. Um, if there are questions from the audience or from the other panelists, just go ahead and speak up. The group is small enough that we don't have to make it uh, difficult. Are there any questions? In the meantime, Walid, I, I was kind of I kind of missed how you determined the the price elasticity. I mean, you had a good critique of existing estimates, but. How, how did you determine the price elasticity in your case? So I calibrated the CES function, the utility function, um, based on the 2017 scenario. Uh, so sigma, um, 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 phi, alpha, were all uh, estimated for, for, for Saudi households, apartments, villas, um, traditional houses. But were they exposed to price variations at that time? I mean, is it like uh, an empirical data set or, or what, what is the, the, the input data for this? No, it's not empirical. So so, so, so um, in, in the base case, I have the 2017 electricity prices applied to the households. They don't re respond in that scenario. When I do apply a real-time pricing scenario based on the utility function that I impose, they respond accordingly to the RTP prices, which are much higher than the 2017 prices. Um, so as, as I showed um, in, in the real-time price uh, results, um, so the marginal costs are the, are the real-time prices. So this is $100 per megawatt hour, for example, which is, which is 10, 10, cents, 10 cents per kilowatt hour price. So it's much higher than the 2017 prices of electricity. Right. And so, curious how, uh, but but still, I mean, I understand that part, but I'm still wondering how you know how much uh, households. Yeah. So based on so based on the RT prices, uh, the model finds which which um, energy efficiency and behavioral response measure combination maximizes well uh, the utility function, the, the, the utility of the households. Right. So based on that, based based on the maximum utility option, which at higher prices uh, results in, in lower electricity use, you can implicitly determine what the price elasticity is. Because okay. you, you know, you know you, using ex post calculations. Are there any other questions from the audience? 
otherwise, um, yeah, then it's time to move on to Edson. Thank you, Walid. Thank uh, you. Edson Daniel Lopez Gonzalez. We'll be talking about energy trading in uh, Brazil, market design and regulatory issues. Hello. Let Hi. me share the screen. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Go ahead, Edson. Good morning, thank you all. I apologize because it's too early here in Brazil, <laughs> but it will not be a problem for us. Uh, my presentations uh, will show some preliminary and qualitative results from our research here about how to improve the, the trading of electricity and energy here in Brazil. Uh, Today, I will present to you some preliminary results concerning some comparisons between the situation that we have now here in Brazil about energy trading and uh, some simulations about what's possible to, to improve if you move for, for example, to a more organized market. market with uh, using a, a clearing house, for example. Okay. Uh, we you see some, a little overview, the motivation, some methods, some information about the data that we have, some results, some preliminary and qualitative results, uh, some conclusion and policy implications until now, and further research. Uh, the situation, uh, that we have now and from the, the literature, uh, the creation of, of an organized environment for energy trading could potentially increase the efficiency uh, of the sector here in Brazil. What is the situation that we have now? Since 2017, our government uh, has launched some work groups and public consultation process to improve the regulation for the entire energy sector here. Uh, but little attention was devoted to the establishment of a, a truly organized market for energy trading. Now, what uh, do you have here? We have an entity, the Energy Commercialization Chamber, uh, a kind of, of a civil organization operating under the, the rules of our regulatory commission, ANEEL, the Brazilian Regulatory Commission that is responsible only by compiling, comp compiling data related to energy production and consumption, and only by the registration and settlement of contracts between the, among the counterparties. But uh, what is the problem? There are no clearing and risk management rules or services that are typical in more organized over-the-counter markets. We will see as a motivation in the next, next slide, because of this kind of environment, we do, not, we do not have clear rules for risk management of the contracts. What do you, do you have? In fact, uh, some contracts like uh, forward or some derivative, typical derivative energy contracts, they not uh, follow typical rules under prudential regulation the rules that are common in financial or capital markets, for example. There is no relationship uh, with the, the, the common rules that we, we need to follow here in Brazil uh, from, the, from our central bank and from our Securities and Exchange Commission here. Uh, we, we have a, a kind of uh, market under no, no rules. <laughs> Uh, a kind of, of a parallel or a, a black market for energy trading here in Brazil. Uh, no, no rules regarding risk management and governance that are typical in more organized markets. We have only the, the settlement and the registration, the settlement at the, find of, at the end of the contract. And because of this, uh, 
what was the, the main motivation. In fact, we, we saw some bankruptcies uh, related to some companies, some trading companies here in Brazil. Uh, and these bankruptcies affected our market entirely in recent years. And because of this, uh, last, in the last government, we started to see some movements, some initiatives to change or to create the rules, to create a good environment for energy trading here in Brazil. <laughs> here, uh, the motivation by itself, uh, we have this kind of environment, environment with no, no rules, no typical rules regarding risk management. Uh, and what more uh, we, we have here in Brazil, typically uh, a high volatility for regarding our spot price for electricity, the PLD in Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, because uh, the nature of our system here, a cost-based dispatch system, uh, dependent on the on the raining, on the reservoirs from large hydropower plant, and because the the changes in the the pattern uh, of raining during recent years in Brazil, the changes in, in the climate, we have been seeing a high volatility for the, the prices in the spot markets. Uh, and uh, in the com this combination, high volatility with no clear rules for risk management, leaded us to some bankruptcies. The, the most famous was the case of Viga Energy, a trader located in Recife, Pernambuco State here in Brazil, with only 10 months of existence. Uh, only 10 millions of Brazilian reais, our currency here, of capital. Uh, that left almost 200 millions of Brazilian reais uh, as default in the contracts, with more than 50 companies or counterparties uh, without the, the electricity in the other part of the of the contracts okay this is the most famous case but we have uh, lots of cases at that time here in Brazil since that time uh, and because of this uh, it became a concern for us uh, regarding the the changes in the entire regulation for the sector the electricity and energy sector in Brazil uh, in December, at the same year, uh, where we have we had the uh, the bankruptcy of Viga Energy, we we have the highest variation in the spot price here, according to the historical series. Uh, a so high uh, price at that time, fifty and fourteen. Brazilian highs by megawatt hour. And uh, this combination was uh, crucial at that time and led some, some companies to the bankruptcy, uh, leaving uh, lots of counterparties uh, without receiving the, the money uh, contracted and the electricity. Okay. Uh, because of this, <laughs> What we started to study since that time, and uh, here have some, as I said, some preliminary and qualitative results from our research. Uh, how can we can we improve the environment that we have now? The how can you, for example, uh, change the the roles of our chamber, the chamber that's used only to for registration of the contracts and for the, the settlement at the end of the contracts, how can you change this entity to, to be more close to a, a clearing house, like we have in Europe, for example, and uh, in more organized markets in United States, Australia, 
and other countries. How can you can we improve the the entity that we have now? Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, would be the the rules that we need to implement to to assure a better or a proper risk management and governance regarding the the negotiations that we have now? Uh, okay. Uh, to to do this, we identified some some things. The expansion of energy derivatives by itself, the clearing house uh, that would be uh, a new institution, but we believe that the the chamber that we have now can can move to this road easily. Uh, a better calculation uh, regarding the financial guarantees for the for trade registration, uh, performing daily adjustment of the positions for each player on a daily basis. Uh, the, the role of a central counterparty. Uh, and uh, we believe that this simple initiatives could result in, uh, in a small and in, in in less systemic risk for us here in Brazil. Okay, because the, the events that I mentioned, and the mainly the event with the that trader, the Viga Electricity, Viga Energy, they they were so important for our sector at, at that time. They they had the potential to to to, to break the things at that time to to make uh, lots of people without electricity provision at that time. Uh, and uh, about the data that we have been studying since that time, and the, that were the source of our preliminary findings here, our focus uh, started with the, the free contracting environment, the free market that we have here in Brazil. Here in Brazil, according to our current regulation, <clears throat> we have uh, a market for the distribution, the discos, the distribution companies, uh, and a free market where it's possible for uh, big players to acquire electricity directly from the, the producers, from the generators. Okay, our focus uh, started in this part of the market, the free market, the free environment. We focus in our four uh, gravity centers or submarkets that we have here in Brazil. We have four uh, submarkets for electricity here, uh, and because of this, the trades of electricity are they are referred to to non-specific submarkets, and uh, we use uh, data in our preliminary estimations from PLD, the spot price. Uh, that's an, a kind of indicator calculated by the chamber, the CCE, and it's a, a kind of proxy for the price, as I said, in the short-term market for electricity here in Brazil. As I said, there's another thing that is specific for us here. Uh, we do not have a, a bid-based market here in Brazil yet. We probably will move for this kind of idea in the next years, but now, and since the beginning of our market here, we have a kind of cost-based market with a central dispatch by a unique operator for the entire country here, okay? Uh, this is the information about the data and what uh, here, a little example about the, the calculations, the evolution of the volatility, the standard deviation in a monthly basis of spot prices, you can see some spikes here, some peaks uh, during the time, peaks that, that are typical for us here. Uh, what uh, are our findings from the beginning of the research from now? First, uh, we identify some improvements uh, through a simple comparison between the chamber that we have now, the entity that is responsible for the registration of the trades that we have now here in Brazil, 
and a typical clearinghouse. Uh, and regarding some categories here about financial settlement, as I said, there is no financial settlement during the life of the contract, only at the end of the contract now in Brazil. Okay. Uh, about the, the clearing, uh, this chamber nowadays perform this work, but there is no guarantee about regarding the settlement. Uh, about the financial guarantees, we have only the, the interested parties. They have only to present some bank guarantees. There is no calculation of margins during the life of the contract or margin, margin requirements or things like this, like in a more organized market. We do not have a central depository uh, and about the accounting uh, nowadays, the chamber uh, takes into account only the spot price realized at, at the end of the contract, the POD, the final price in the expiration of the contract. Uh, because of this, the parties have to bear too much risk un until the, the expiration of the contract. And uh, they, they may go to the bankruptcy because of this. Uh, what uh, do we want? Uh, and it's similar to the I think that's performed typically by a clearing house uh, to implement daily adjustments. Uh, this thing is possible here in Brazil because we have uh, daily prices for electricity and they are implementing since the beginning of this year, hourly prices for electricity here in Brazil from our operator. Uh, until now, the, the prices that we have here, they are in a monthly or a, a weekly basis. Since the beginning of this year, we have daily basis for prices and the hour, hourly basis too, okay? So it's possible to implement some mechanism like this, daily adjustments uh, until the expiration of the contract, okay? And the uh, risk management procedures, we do not have uh, now any risk management procedure that's typical for an organization like this. And we, we believe that we can implement some typical uh, mechanisms and, and typical measures to be monitored, okay, by our supervisors or by our regulatory commission. We also have performed some research related to what uh, were the developments in other countries? We identify some interesting things in United Kingdom, uh, an initiative uh, performed by Ofgen in UK. Uh, and you can see uh, a significant gap before and after the implementation of the clearing house in England. Uh, and we, we saw uh, the, the volatility and the spread being reduced. Another interesting experience that we can uh, use here in Brazil is from the Intercontinental Exchange, the ICE. Uh, in December of 2003, they launched a clearing with brought the annual volume to, to about 510 million of contracts. They improved the liquidity of the market with the clearing house, okay? Things that we do not have here in Brazil now, the liquidity for the market for the electricity contracts, there is no liquidity. And uh, risk management, the volatility is so high for us here in Brazil. And uh, these this things, uh, they affect the investment decisions made by generators, for example. Uh, what more, we, we studied some uh, derivatives. How can you use some derivatives uh, to, to improve the risk management of the, the market that we have now? Here we have a simple example of swap regarding the, the spot price that we have now and uh, considering two submarkets or gravity centers of our market here in Brazil. So uh, we have the fact that we can uh, use derivatives now to improve 
the liquidity of the market and the, the risk management too. And here uh, we, we performed also some numerical examples, uh, trying, attempting to compare the situation that we have now with the chamber, with the role that the chamber have, uh, has now. And uh, the results that we will get uh, with a clearing house. Here is a simple uh, operation uh, in that uh, an anti sold short electricity here in Brazil in some sub-market here, southwest. We have the price uh, agreed for, for sale, the, the amount of electricity the, and the dates here. Uh, and we have the realization of the spot price, the PLD on a daily basis. And we have the, some, some simple calculations. What is the problem? If you see here the, the last table, the last column, we can see the, the result in our local currency here in Brazil accumulated. Uh, what will be the problem? With the, the current roles, uh, we only consider in the final result, the, the number in red here is about in our example, in this example, it's about 36 millions of Brazilian reais, a big loss that can cause uh, another bankruptcy like in recent years. If you move to, to rules from a typical clearing house, we can avoid this result because we will take into account the results in the middle of the, the table here. For example, if when we, we saw or when we have the first negative result uh, following the typical rules of a clearing house, uh, we can stop this kind of, of a transaction and we can avoid the, the spread of system, systemic risk for other counterparties involved and for the entire market here in Brazil. That's it's a simple, simple idea that we do not have now. Okay. It's, it's, it's almost time to wrap up. Okay. Uh, so uh, concluding, uh, this is, I, I present to you today this morning, the first preliminary results from our research about how to improve the environment for energy trading here in Brazil. And uh, we, our preliminary findings indicated some, that some simple improvements can, can help our market to be, to be better. In the implementation of a clearing house uh, with another entity to be created or using the, the chamber of a commercial, commercial stage that we have now and uh, using some derivative contracts and some simple risk management rules. Uh, as a further research, we are starting to, to, to study some market design issues by itself, connecting the, the trading of electricity with the trading of natural gas that we have here in Brazil is starting to develop. The water market here that we are starting to develop too and uh, with the other segments of the entire electricity sector here in Brazil, generation, distribution, and transmission. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Edson. Thank you. Any questions from the audience or speakers? In the meantime, I was wondering, uh, is the main motivation now of your proposal the counterparty risk, or is it also about standardization, a reduction of transaction costs? Yes, perfect, perfect. Yes, the counterpart credit risk is the probably the the main main goal. <laughs> because the main goal, you deal with that by you have a platform. You basically, you, the, the 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 platform absorbs the counterparty risk and then spreads it. Basically, is, is that? Yes. Yes. We 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 think that. Uh, a new platform, a new entity, or maybe the, the entity that we have now with some improvements and, and with this, this role, central, central counterparty credit risk, I believe it's uh, essential for, for our market here. Because- uh, how, do you, how, how do you then avoid fly-by-night uh, traders who 
take big, big risks, take the profit away, and then if it goes wrong, then the risk is socialized over the platform, and, and you know they go bankrupt, and the risk goes to the platform. Yes. How do you yes. avoid that? It's a it's a kind of uh, old west. <laughs> this yeah, but I mean, how do you avoid this kind of behavior where? Parties take a lot of profit as long as things go well. And then when things go wrong, then they just let their trading company go bankrupt. The profit has moved out. And then the platform would have to pay the risk. So how do you how do you keep them from abusing the platform that way? Uh, we believe that uh, because of the situation that we have now, uh, and because of the current rules, as I mentioned, it's easy now in Brazil to, to create uh, with some little capital in Brazilian reais in our local currency. It's easy to create a, a trading company for electricity here in Brazil. It's so easy to create. Right. Yeah, and uh, we believe that we have to change the situation too. And uh, believe that with the, the, the new rules, with the, the platform for counterparty credit risk and the clearing house, we will attract uh, better players. But uh, how, does the, how does the platform keep out the bad guys? How does it discourage them? Uh, with some uh, guarantee or collateral requirements. Oh, okay. The, the, the collateral requirements that we have now, they are so weak too. Uh, they, they have to present only a, a bank guarantee, contract with a bank. Uh -huh. uh, uh, with with too too small liquidity, uh, and that is easy to get from our banks, commercial banks here in Brazil, uh, and there there are not uh, now uh, any calculations regarding collateral requirements or margins in a daily or weekly basis. Right, and we believe that with the simple implementations, we can have, we, we can avoid avoid the bad guys. We can yeah. take out the the bad players from the yeah. market. You require limitations. Okay, anyone else? Well, thank you, Edson. Then we move on to Adriana. Have you resolved your technical issues? I think, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Good. Oh, perfect. Um, can you also share your screen? Yeah, we're seeing it in um, draft mode right now. Okay, are we seeing it full or? It's still, it's still draft mode. Um... I think you need to first put it on presentation mode and then share it. Yeah, I'm going to show my whole screen. Okay. Okay. Is it yep. any better? Perfect. Okay, great. So, hello everyone. My name is Adrian. Um, I'm not yet a future um, a PhD student, but I will be in a few weeks. And I've been working at uh, RTE, the, the French TSO, for a year now. And uh, with uh, Olivier Massol and Yannick Pires, uh, we've been uh, uh, drafting drafting some ideas around batteries and how they play on uh, two uh, different tables. The first one is a uh, balancing of uh, load and also uh, the, uh, the expansion of the electricity grid. Um, so first, historically, uh, the exercise of transmission expansion planning was uh, undergone by a single utility and uh, both exercises were coordinated. So first, the utility would envision what future load and production would be in the future. And uh, based on its prediction, uh, it would uh, plan some investment in generation. So plan some uh, new uh, nuclear plants, gas plants, or anything else. And uh, after that, it will plan its grid based on the generation investment. Um, well, this has changed, of course, since and nowadays, uh, the utilities are no longer coordinated because uh, there was a regulation. And um, 
RTE is now uh, not allowed to operate any production plant at all. So uh, it's only allowed to operate grid, but it still needs to do sports exercise to plan its grid investment. Um, nowadays, it has to include new technical solution uh, within the grid planning. So what we do nowadays is the following exercise is kind of sum up with this uh, small graph. So we take energy policies from government with uh, renewable energy sources targets, new limitation and eventual uh, and sometimes uh, renewable energy sources uh, curtailment limitation. Based on all this data and uh, some uh, cost data for other uh, non uh, politically set targets, uh, we uh, plan what's socially optimal, what is the social optimal for the load and the supply balancing. So we have uh, various climatic years and we have all the dispatching and each European country is represented as a node. So within each country, it's a copper plate, but there are a limited transfer capacity between countries uh, representing interconnections. And this exercise uh, tells us what's the future optimal load and production uh, generation and the dispatch. And based on these, uh, we will uh, plan the grid investment. So we, we take the, the existing grid infra infrastructures and we, uh, we put the future loads and future productions from uh, various uh, uh, types of energy. And then we, we just, Iterate to find the optimal, the socially optimal uh, level of grid investment. So we we need to do both exercise, yeah, as a as a TSO to to know our future uh, grid inf infrastructures. And uh, there is a challenge uh, that appeared with uh, the new uh, solution. It's a battery electrical storage system. Yes, and. Um, this is a challenge because battery uh, can play on two different sides. Uh, they have a value first for load and supply balancing. It basically just shifts a production when it's uh, very cheap uh, for, for time when it's very expensive. That's a very natural uh, behavior and it's uh, energy arbitrage. Uh, that's the first value. And when we uh, do the generation expansion planning uh, exercise, uh, we capture only this first value. And then we do the transmission expansion planning. And when we do the transmission expansion planning, well, actually battery also can also play a role. It will, uh, it will uh, complete the traditional uh, grid investments because uh, it can uh, defer line investment. So we see that battery have, has battery can have two different value. It can play on two on the two different exercise, but we don't capture the full value at one single time. Each time we only capture half half or a part uh, of its value, and thus thus we fail to reveal what would be in the future the optimal uh, volumes of battery that the grid and the the electricity system would need. So yeah, we need to grasp the, the full potential. So before going further on this, I'm just gonna uh, say a bit more about the battery electrical st system storage value. Well, we don't adopt a market perspective. If from a market perspective, the, the battery value is uh, from energy arbitrage, from reserves, like uh, the frequency containment reserves or primary reserves and a capacity mechanism if there is any. But what we were doing now is we want to capture the value for the load and expansion balancing problems. So that is, uh, say, it's uh, within the optimal dispatch uh, exercise. And like I said, a battery can help balancing the, the future electricity mix like by shifting, for example, uh, photovoltaic production, solar production, within a day from the day to the evening, for example. And the other value is uh, the, grid, uh, the grid value. 
And I, like I said, it can defer line reinforcement by managing local congestions. And I have an example to, to illustrate this. So here uh, in blue, you can see the renewable energy sources uh, production or capacity we, we have to evacuate. And over time, uh, the blue line uh, uh, is, is rising because uh, there are more and more uh, renewable energy sources being installed on the on this point uh, in, in, the, in the grid. It, it, we, are, we are looking at what node within the whole grid. And uh, as uh, we connect more and more uh, renewable energy sources, uh, we are, uh, there is um, some spilled energy that appear. And at the second period of time, we see the dark blue. And we see that there are spilled energy that the, the line uh, just cannot evacuate because uh, it's not uh, uh, dimension to do so. It wasn't uh, planned to evacuate such a level of production. So we see the dark blue rising, second period of time. And third period of time, well, we, we can invest in the storage. Not we, uh, but storage can be useful at this time because it will uh, reduce the it will reduce the spilled energy. Uh, maybe it will reduce it fully, maybe not. But for some times, we know that uh, the spilled energy will not rise because we will uh, probably have a contract with a storage operator that will just manage all the congestion or hopefully all the congestion on the line and thus reduce for us the, the spilled energy. Because as a TSO, we are responsible for the spilled build energy on, on our lines. And eventually uh, at the fourth period, the, the level of uh, grid capacity to evacuate still rises. And we thus have to eventually proceed to a line reinforcement. Uh, what I want to show here is where is the storage uh, grid value. The storage grid value is not uh, in the reduction of the congestion because uh, the line reinforcement could have done it but it's in the deferral of the line reinforcement. We, we postpone the line reinforcement by some years, thanks to the uh, storage. And moreover, thanks to the storage, we might be able to adapt according to how the rest capacity to evacuate evolves in the future. So maybe actually it wouldn't rise as uh, it's on the graph, but it would decrease after some time, and then we will realize that we wouldn't have needed to uh, proceed to a line reinforcement and the storage uh, would ha uh, will have been uh, perfectly sufficient. So um, eventually, what, what is our aim? Well, as, as a TS, so we want to uh, reveal the, the optimally, uh, the, socially, uh, the socially economic optimal uh, volume of uh, storage we would need in the future. Um, behind this is uh, uh, we have uh, we need to send some signals. We maybe need to develop some contracts, especially contracts for managing congestions. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, we need to plan for this in advance if we need it in the future. And we need to need we also need to need how much of storage we would really need. Um, those values I talked about the values for load and balancing for load balancing and the value for grid uh, expansion. This, this value, of course, they overlap. But uh, because when a battery operates on the congestions, uh, it might not be able to simultaneously operate for uh, load balancing. But uh, still, these two value also, they partially overlap. They also uh, sum one, uh, one on top of the other. And uh, well, our idea would be to iterate uh, between uh, the two exercises of uh, generation expansion and transmission expansion planning and to uh, try to catch the full value of the battery electrical storage system. Uh, that's it for me. I know it's a bit short and I'm sorry about that and it's a bit uh, raw, but like I said, I haven't yet started the PhD, so I haven't much more to, to present to you, but I will gladly, gladly uh, take any uh, comment you might have uh, as it might help my future work. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Adrian. Um, are there questions or comments from the audience? Otherwise, I, I have a few. Um, one is, are you as RTE planning to operate the, the, the battery also, let's see, for energy arbitrage? Uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, but are you well, saying, are we planning on operating the storage as RTE? Yeah, but I mean, you can you could use it purely for congestion, but you said in your slide, we are mm -hmm. planning to capture the full value stack. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as RTE, as RTE, you will yeah. enter the competitive market and start to compete with market parties in energy <laughs> arbitrage, yeah. balancing provision, balancing services, etc. Yeah, right? Yes. right. So yes, as a TSO, we are not allowed to operate as a battery, of course. When I say we, are, we want to capture the full values, the stacked values, it means uh, in our exercise of uh, planning load and supplies in the future. Uh, because, yes, we would not be the operator. Of course, uh, it would be operated by a, a third party and we would contract the service for grid uh, mm -hmm. congestion. And the third party would uh, do the energy arbitrage and everything else, FCR and whatever, on its own uh, when we when, when we are not contracting uh, the congestion service. Right. That seems to me the, the appropriate way to go. But that means yeah. that the CSO have to have a very proper contract to make sure that the battery is available for congestion management when you need it. So yeah. You have to uh, we, very carefully. Yeah. Well. We're planning on doing this contract and the uh, UNIDIS, the, the French DSO has already uh, uh, published one of this contract, but we are working on one of this contract and it's a bit tricky to, to plan for a service that is uh, not very easy to forecast, which is quick congestion because they are very uh, intermittent. Yes, and of course, it, the, the congestion is caused in your case by solar energy being fed back from the distribution grid, is that right? Because you're talking about- Yeah, solar. yeah. So yeah, when people so suddenly buy a lot of solar panels, you get suddenly a lot higher level of congestion. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, it's true for solar, it's true for uh, for wind, uh, because in your in France, RTE operates a grid starting from uh, 63 uh, kilovolts. We have uh, some uh, big uh, renewable uh, parks that are connected to our grid, and we are seeing these uh, problems to evacuate the, the production okay. when production is really high. And how do you, like in your contract, let's say you have an overproduction of solar and you need to spill energy. Well, instead you have a battery, so you put that energy in the battery. Now, when there's an overproduction of solar, the wholesale price tends to be low, so the battery at the same time, we'll be, let's say, reducing the congestion by absorbing this surplus energy. But then by selling it, let's say, later in the evening, uh, when the sun is low, the value also increases. So it, it will be, let's say, the, the same battery cycle can help relieve congestion and earn money in the wholesale market. So how do yes. you make sure your contract party is not double dipping and charging you for congestion management and making a profit on the battery? Yes, yeah, so, well, as long as we are seeing less congestion on our grid than what there would have been without the, the storage, then we know the, the storage has uh, relieved congestion and we will, uh, grant, we will reward it. Uh, and if the two, uh, if for example, FCR, FCR and um, congestion both uh, are both going in the same way. For example, uh, congestion and FCR both asking the battery to charge. Well, if they are uh, simultaneously going the same way, but well, the battery can uh, win two, can get two at the same times, at the same time. Does it answer the? Yeah. Well, in theory, see if the if the companies who are bidding to for the contract. At full knowledge, they would factor in all this extra revenue, and competition would mean that they would, uh, the, the tender price for RTE would not be too bad. 
But the big problem, I think, is that the market parties have no idea what the operating conditions will be. So they have a high risk, which probably means that they will charge more. Right? The higher the risk, the higher the, the, uh, the risk premium that they will put in the contract with RTE. Yeah. Unless there's some kind of variable component that removes some of the risk from the tenders, from the battery operators, then you might find that they could bid more competitively. Yeah, well, it's the, the, the competitive bid will only happen once at the beginning. Right. Because only one storage will be installed. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I mean. I mean, at, at that point, they have to have an idea of the whole operational cycle of the battery yeah. and then the revenues from market activities and yeah. people know that then they will we, we plan on we plan on asking them for uh, uh we plan on rewarding them on two different sides for example our first will be a capacity remuneration uh for example you will be paid for a, like a capacity mechanism basically and second uh, part of remuneration will be for activation for the mega water uh relieved from the grid Right. And both prices uh, will be uh, both prices uh, will be uh, set for the whole contract period. A contract will be a few years, and um, eventually the battery, the storage solution, still has to be less expensive than the grid reinforcement, because we compare. Right. This have an upper bound now, to the contract. There yeah. is, there are a competition between storage operators and also with the grid solution traditionally. Right. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I'm, I'm, I've done a lot of work in capacity markets and I've for a long time wondered how do you remunerate battery storage in a capacity market? Because the traditional resources like traditional power plants, they sell capacity and they can produce the energy infinitely basically, as long as they have fuel. Yeah. The battery, of course, has a finite amount of energy. So how do you handle that in valuing the yeah. market contribution? Yeah, for the capacity mechanism in France, uh, I don't know for elsewhere, but in France, what we have is a, is a ratio that represents how many hours uh, every day where the capacity mechanism uh, takes place. It means winter days, pretty cold days. There are 10 hours that are uh, set uh, and uh, if it can only contribute maybe to half of the day, there will be like a 60% coefficient. So it will not grab the full value of the capacity mechanism, but 60% of the value. Okay, so the standard expect, expect or well, the, let's say the, 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 the regulated contract duration or, well, the capacity needs to be provided for 10 hours. And if you have energy for five hours, then you just reduce it by half. Yeah. Yeah. more or less it's not very linear it's more okay. Yeah. okay 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 there is a question in the in the chat uh I'm not sure. go ahead Just... uh, oh yeah or do Let's i mark need... it on the... um batteries make money in the us yeah yes yeah, so, so my comment is not really a question uh, but more yeah. about how batteries are used in a, in a power mm -hmm. grid so there, in, the, in the US, for example, in that one year, uh, they estimated that on average across all, sample, all the sampled sets, two thirds of revenues are attributed, attributed to frequency regulation rather yeah. than the real time market. So frequency yeah. regulation seems to be an important usage of batteries. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But when we do the generation expansion planning exercise, we don't uh, look at the frequency reserve. We assume it will be met, target for the frequency reserve will be met. And what we only look at is a load balancing uh, classic problem. So it's true that we don't uh, grasp this value and maybe some battery could, uh, um, more battery could uh, appear in the future if we grasp the FCR value in our um, grid planning. The sides, but it's true. Also, RCR price uh, in France, uh, in Europe, are uh, set to decline in the coming years because of increased competition. So, uh, 
that we will be less and less able to rely on uh, frequency regulation to, to make ends meet. I, I agree with that. Um, with all the electric vehicles and, and smart charging, if you let all these vehicles participate in the FCR market, then uh, that will cause a huge uh, increase in, in, in um, yeah, in the supply of the service and in competition. A great thing about a battery is, of course, that you can move it in and move it out quickly, right? A battery is somewhat mobile. Yeah. So it's a quick response to a congestion. And then when you have the enforcement, you can move it to another congestion location. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, and then uh, I'd like to give the word to uh, Richard Weinholt from Berlin. Or are there any, sorry, I forgot to ask. Are, are there no other questions from the audience for Adrienne? If not, then we move on to Richard. Okay. Okay, let me see if I can make this work. Okay, can you see the screen? Can you hear my voice? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. I see the screen, yeah, looks quite good. Hey, brilliant. Bye. So, um, Welcome to my presentation on flow-based market coupling in fundamental electricity market models and on methods and effects of its parameterization. So this is joint work with my colleague Robert Need within the Modesain project and the development of our electricity market model with the friendly name Pomato. Um, oh, now I clicked in the wrong thing. I click here, that's good, okay. Um, let's start with the agenda of this talk, and I will also try to front load some of the results and intuitions. Um, to motivate this research, I want to present the current state and challenges of the European electricity market and its transition towards a more sustainable future. Then I will go over the modeling process of flow-based market coupling, where I want to illustrate that all modeling steps can be done through a specific parameterization of the well-known economic dispatch problem. I want to highlight the main aspects of flow-based market coupling parameterization, which are the base case, minimum remaining available margins, critical network elements and contingencies, generation shift yields, and reliability margins, and overall, I want to introduce you to the notion that flow-based market coupling can provide either a very restrictive or permissive, permissive trading domain to the day ad market based on the chosen parameters. The literature overview will illustrate that while there's a consensus on the modeling procedure, the parameterizations are far less consistent and our numerical experiments are done on a two live data set of the Central Western European region. And we try to relate permissive and restrictiveness to the model results by comparing composition of costs and generation. So let's start with the motivation, which comes from modeling zonal electricity market and its means for capacity allocation and capacity management, uh, congestion management. The method of capacity allocation, meaning the allocation of commercial exchange capacities was until 2015 done using static net transfer capacities, which come with a specific set of problems. In 2015, the capacity allocation by entities was replaced by as the preferred method by flow-based market coupling, which comes with a new set of solutions, but also with plenty of problems and questions. <clears throat> While central to the European electricity market, flow-based market coupling is still new and many issues that will arise in the short and midterm are still not addressed or very well discussed. Those are namely the extension of the flow-based region to the core region, so from central Western Europe, more to the Eastern Europe, the effect of minimum trading capacities in the flow-based process, changes of bidding zone configurations, which would namely be the German price zone, um, or the inclusion of remedial actions, high voltage DC lines, or phase shifting transformers in the process. Flow based market coupling is a multi stage process coordinated by the TSOs, which involves detailed zone specific net load and generation forecasts and network models, which are not only partially disclosed by the TSOs. Specifically, this three step process consists of a D minus two look ahead capacity forecast also called base case, which represents the best estimate of the system state at delivery. Based on this forecast, so-called flow-based market coupling parameters are calculated and used to constrain the commercial exchange in the day ahead market stage. Lastly, in D minus zero, 
or the D minus zero stage consists of intraday adjustments and congestion management, meaning the physical delivery. Academic publications suddenly become more plentiful and generally there's a consensus on the modeling process that follows this that follows these three steps, right? So D minus two, D minus one, D minus zero, uh, akin to the real process, utilizing an economic dispatch problem at every step. Which is one to, what I want to describe next. Um, so this economic dispatch problem can be formulated in a very general way uh, as seen in equations one, um, which finds the most cost-effective allocation of generation capacities to meet demand subject to capacity, curtailment and storage constraints, right? So we have an energy balance, a nodal energy balance, a zonal energy balance, storage constraints and capacity constraints for generation and generation from intermittent energy resources. Depending on the step in the flow-based process, equations one can be subject to transport constraints, which enforce limits on individual lines based on nodal power injections or commercial exchange. Here depicted in 2A or 2B, right? So feasible regions 2A or 2B using nodal or zonal PTTF or enforce, <clears throat> sorry, or enforce static limits like NTCs on commercial exchange as is in 2C. This means that the base case, for example, so the D minus two capacity forecast can be modeled by solving problem one subject to either 2A, 2B or 2C, depending on the chosen parameterization. And similarly, the day ahead market clearing can be modeled by solving equations one subject to the feasible region 2B. So, um, meaning constraining the net positions or commercial exchanges to the feasible region defined by a zonal PTTF and capacities for selected lines or contingencies. The D minus zero con congestion management stage or for the congestion management stage, the objective function has to be augmented by redispatching costs, which occur for changing day ahead generation schedules and network feasibility has to be ensured by feasible region 2A, right? So by um, a standard PTTF formulation for a specific set of lines. <clears throat> of particular interest is the processing of the flow-based parameters from base case result, which follows the intuition of equation four um, um, such that remaining transmission capacity is made available for changes in net position, meaning for commercial exchanges. Given that, net, the, that the net position delta is, is between base case and the day ahead market is small, we can anticipate a dispatchable subset of plants that will serve this delta. This participation factor is called generation shift B and is used as a mapping to transform the nodal power transfer distribution factor matrix. So a node to line sensitivity into a zonal PTTF a zone to line sensitivity. A quick reformulation of four yields equation six um, that can be more or less directly used as a network representation for the day ahead market clearing. The main observation that I want to highlight at this point is that the resulting feasible region of six has to be at least non-empty to find an optimal solution or any solution for that case, which is not necessarily given and either requires a specific parameterization of the base case, for example, by enforcing margins on lines and contingencies or processing the PTTF and remaining available margins. Um, at, at uh, after completing the base case or with a base case at hand. This can be done by selecting specific network elements that compose the PTTF and force minimum remaining available margin values or enforce a whole minimum trade domain based on net transfer capacities or, or already allocated capacities. And uh, as I aware this afternoon, there's a talk specifically on that, which I will definitely check out. The general notion I want to highlight at this point uh, is that this parameterization is done for 
three main reasons, or mainly for three reasons, to ensure secure operation, which means less congestion management. This could be done by security margins on RAM or by selecting a larger or specific case of critical network elements and contingencies. Second, to enlarge the domain. This is more in line with regulation, which aims to achieve a higher level of price convergence. This could be done through increasing minimum available margins, or so min RAMs, or enforcing entire minimum trading domains. Or third, to be more accurate, which is, I think, uh, what most academic publications strive for and where I would locate more technical questions regarding the generation shift key or the validity of generation shift keys or studies related to reference flows or loop flows. In any case, this parameterization is where most academic publications greatly differ. And this table shows a selection of academic publications and it also represents of how not to make a PowerPoint slide. Um, but the main point of it is that the that that, diff, that these academic publications differ greatly when it comes to base case, selecting critical network elements and contingencies, MinRAM and GSKs. In addition to the large variety of parameterization, the studies also conduct a large variety of numerical analysis. So they look at very different things. It's very difficult to compare these type of uh, different parameterizations, which results in, a, in another motivation, achieving a more consistent picture of the parameterization and its effects. And in this presentation, I want to focus on the permissiveness or restrictiveness of trading domains and thereby maybe establishing a more high level or categorization rather than looking into, okay, how specifically is the base case uh, parameterized? So um, this is a good point to um, talk about the case study. And the data set covers the CWE region with network and all neighboring countries with full power plant stack and all underlying data comes from various projects in the open data community. These are namely the Open Power Systems Data Platform and JRC Hydro Power Plant Database for existing generation capacities um, the grid grid project for network data, which essentially represents a scrape of the ENSOE grid map. Uh, future wind and PV capacities are derived from studies performed by my colleague Leonard Goeke and the capacity expansion model Animod. And these are regionalized using NUTS3 potentials or potentials on, on NUTS3 level provided by the open data portal of the Forschungsstelle für Energiewirtschaft, FFE. Availabilities and inflows are calculated using the absolutely brilliant Python package called Adlite, and zonal load is taken from the NSOE transparency platform and is regionalized also to NUTS3 areas um, by sector-specific GDP values and standard load profiles. All of this will be published along the electricity market model Pomato, but as many of you know, theory and reality diverge quite a bit when it comes to automating this sort of data work, but this will happen in the next few weeks because it's also part of the project and part of the um, supposed to be part of the research paper itself. This brings us to the specific scenarios used. Generally, we compare the status quo, so 2020, with the target year 2030, with substantial increases in intermittent generation capacities. And we differentiate between an anti seam market clearing with subsequent redispatch and three flow-based market coupling scenarios with different parameterization. The network data of the GridKit project uh, includes some lines that are marked as under constructions, but others are added such as the DC links of the 10 year network development plan. The parameters, of, the parameters of the network elements itself are estimated from literature and this is described in detail in the Pomato documentation. The installed capacities can be seen in figures on the left. The main difference are the uh, wind and PV capacities between the two target years. Capacity and location of conventional power plants for 2030 is a difficult problem. Currently, I manually decommission certain power plants like nuclear and coal in, in, in Germany, um, but it's very difficult to decide which plants go and which plants remain and whether or not um, the network nodes will actually lose capacity or if it will be um, um, just change, a change in te generation technologies or if other generation technologies, dispatchable technologies will um, take the place. 
the weather year is 2019, which also defines load availabilities and inflows, and the reference entities are derived from 2019 commercial exchange values, and a single value there is used for the entire model horizon. Um, the results are only for one month in May, um, with the full year calculations still pending, and certain results will change, but I think that or my intuition is that the higher level perspective will likely be very similar. Um, the reason that it's uh, that I will focus on a, a single month of May is that this problem becomes fairly big and to, to solve it um, takes quite a bit of time. And obviously if I uh, run in, a, in an error to an error in, in July, then the whole model run fails. So I go month by month. The scenarios are modeled as previously shown where the D minus two capacity forecast look ahead stage or base case is calculated with full network representation over a rolling horizon of 24 hours. The flow based parameters are then derived using two generation shift key strategies, Gmax and ProRata. The first weighs the participation factor of nodes in zonal net position changes based on installed dispatchable generation, the latter by the capacity online during that time. Therefore, also, therefore this ProRata GSK is also denoted as DUN for dynamic in the following charts. The nodal PTTF is composed of critical network elements that are selected based on a 5% sensitivity threshold towards commercial exchange. This is also in line with what, what uh, the TSO are doing in, in the process, or that's the, the value taken from the flow-based documentation, which results in around 440 critical network elements. And each of those is subject to contingencies that are selected based on the impact in case of an outage and if this one this exceeds 20% of the current line flows, which amounts to a total zonal PTTF with, with length of around or with uh, more than 3000 elements for each time step. The ramps are processed to provide at least 20 or 40% of the uh, respective critical network elements, thermal capacity, so just the min ram condition. Um, these flow-based parameters are used to constrain the D minus one market clearing and are calculated over the, which is then calculated over the full model horizon. The resulting market result is depicted, uh, is then redispatched uh, in a third step where generation schedule of non-storage plants within CWE can be adjusted subject to additive costs for curtailment and redispatch to ensure feasibility in the network. The figure on the left uh, shows a cost decomposition for this flow-based process with a 20% with min ram for the 20% min ram scenario. First, the base case considering all lines finds a cost-effective allocation of generation capacity. The second bar represents a day at market clearing subject to flow-based parameters, which in this case already induces a more constrained dispatch. After congestion management, the third bar represents the total costs, meaning all generation costs and costs for congestion management will be the ones that we are mostly interested in. So let's look at uh, the results. Um, in the graphs on the left, we can see the total costs between the different scenarios for 2020 and 2030, namely the flow-based market coupling scenarios for 20 and 40 MinRAM, or 40% MinRAM, which use the GMAX generation shift key and the scenarios using the ProRata GSK, which employs a 20% MinRAM and is denoted as GSK DUN for a dynamic. On the right-hand side, we see the NTC reference scenario. The first result is that we can see is that total costs decrease between 2020 and 2030 due to the influx of intermittent generation capacity. I think this is uh, quite intuitive. Uh, secondly, the flow-based scenarios have systematically lower system costs independent of parameterization and result also in lower costs for congestion management. Difference, dif difference between the flow-based parameters exists, but with lower effect. It is noteworthy that the cost for congestion management increase only for the flow-based market coupling scenarios between 2020 and 2030, and the difference between those scenarios reduce as well. So these two charts only depict the cost for redispatch and cost for containment. 
if we pick out the flow-based market coupling scenario with 40% minimum, which provided the lowest system cost, we can find that the scenario is more restrictive than the NTC reference, which is indicated by higher costs in the D-1 market clearing stage compared to the NTC solution. These costs are, however, overcompensated by lower costs in congestion management. So we can see that the market clearing in the 40% min-ram scenario, and then the, the total costs, so what, what only the um, only redispatch costs come on top. And um, if we compare the market result or the cost for the market clearing process between the flow-based scenario and the NTC scenario, we can see lower costs in the NTC scenario, um, indicating a more restrictive trading domain in the flow-based market coupling solution but then the costs are overcompensated by higher costs for congestion management. Um, we can indeed confirm this by looking into the hourly commercial exchange values, blue for 2020 and red for 2030. The three flow-based scenarios on the left and the NTC scenarios on the very right and the NTC scenario on the very right, right? So the, the, the NTC scenarios and the three flow-based scenarios. Here the NTC, values are higher in mean for both target years, but also extend far wider. An interesting side result is that the range of commercial exchanges in 2030 for all scenarios extends far wider in general, and which, which indicates a larger variety of exchanges at that target year. Um, the effect of lower costs in the market clearing stage and higher cost for congestion management can also be seen when looking into the shadow price of the respective market clearing stage. Here we see a contour map with the mean shadow price over the model horizon for the NTC D minus one market clearing. Note that the price differences right, indicated by the color bar on the right of these graphs is pretty small, which is expected due to the permissiveness of the commercial exchange constraint. However, at D minus one, in the D minus one redispatch stage, we see a much larger range of prices, both in 2020 and 2030, indicating the high volume of congestion management. The same depiction for the 40% MinRAM scenario shows higher prices and price differences at the market clearing stage. However, comparatively lower prices during the redispatch stage. And I know I've, I'm flying through the slides and, um, but, um, the, these, these slides will be uploaded afterwards. And uh, these, these graphs are, uh, obviously are uh, very nice and nice to look at. And uh, I think it's also worth to then maybe take the time afterwards to figure them out or look at it. Um, let me change the clock so it's 10 paths. And um, it seems like that time is uh, similarly constrained as flow-based market coupling domains. So I will only briefly touch on the composition of redispatch itself, which is composed mostly of, on, of wind and PV for negative changes in generation schedule and positive changes usually follow along the merit order uh, of conventional generation. Overall, the share of renewables is around 50% in the 2020 scenario and around 70% for the 2030 scenario. I guess this is also, um, Within, within reason, I guess. It's not a super crazy, um, uh, I guess it's a, maybe a, a more bureaucratic scenario rather than a, a dreamy 100% renewable scenario. Um, again, it's interesting to see that uh, the redispatch quantity for the NTC scenario remains constant. And we can also look at the composition of redispatch. So where does redispatch happen? And in this case, we can see that um, while the, the, the quantity remains constant, uh, the, the pattern or where redispatch happens um, uh, differs quite a bit, and, it's, and this is different in the flow-based scenarios. But both 2030 scenarios or all 2030 scenarios see quite a bit of curtailment in the, in the North and Baltic Sea areas, which might be because of uh, bad parameterization of the networks there. Um, which brings me to the conclusion, which um, I want to highlight the, the uh, restrictiveness or permissiveness of commercial exchange domain, which is central to the effectiveness of the capacity allocation and congestion management in zonal electricity markets.
parameters. And in these examples, the flow-based parameterization was in general more restrictive than the reference NTC parameterization, which resulted in, compared to the NTC reference, higher costs in the D minus one market clearing stage, however, overall lower costs due to less congestion management. This effect can be seen in the resulting commercial exchange and resulting lower price convergence in the market clearing stage, but then again, higher price convergence at D minus zero. And these regional effects can be obviously seen in the price, but also can seen in redispatch patterns. Um, as a maybe a quick outlook um, and a to-dos or problems or critics that, that that comes along with this. The question regarding a good NTC or flow-based parameterization remains. Um, and it, it, one could say, okay, you spend so much time parameterizing flow-based market coupling, maybe you could spend a little bit time to find good NTCs because maybe these were the, the ones that you that I included, maybe they were just not, the, the not, not very good ones in the end, um, which is a super valid, valid, uh, valid point, but, um, the nice thing about flow-based market coupling is that we can parameterize the, the, the trading domains based on these, these like higher level values rather than setting explicit uh, bidirectional commercial exchange capacities. And the rolling horizon market clearing allows to run this model on modest hardware. So running this in my home office is possible and I do not rely on a high performance cluster or something like this. But then again, um, rolling horizon models uh, sub find suboptimal solutions and might pose problems or especially regarding hydro reservoirs or the, the, the um, intertemporal nature of hydro generation. Further, parameterization is still required, this especially line expansion, con conventional capacities and demand from av available sectors. So in this case, I'd as I have assumed the same demand uh, in both scenarios, which is probably not, um, not a very, uh, or an assumption that is certainly uh, can be discussed. And obviously the full year results have to be um, uh, uh, planned for the final publication. Um, thank you very much for, thank you for the, for your attention and I'm happy to, to answer questions or receive any feedback yeah, or anything in between. Thank you, Richard, for a packed presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? I noted that you, we're able to um, reduce the cost of, of redispatch in the short term by a very large factor, but then in 2030, it bounced back up. Uh, is that because you factor in the, let's say the unpredictability of, of renewables in the, let's say the day ahead time horizon? Is, is that the main driver for the congestion? Um, so, I mean, to the extent that you can forecast renewables, you can already include them in the flow-based market coupling, right? Yeah. So. Um, it seems that the, the this, um, of um, of the of the it's a difficult question to answer. First, I would I, I would have assumed that it's it's because I placed the renewables on at the wrong nodes, right? So it's that that I just have some systematic redispatch because of the data set. But because the NTC reference case does not really uh, suffer the same fate as the flow based. Um, situation or the the, the, the flow-based scenarios it's it, it it seems to have something to do with with the parameterization and the the ability to kind of um, um, correctly forecast which which network nodes are um, with uh, yeah which network nodes or which which network elements will be the congested ones but yeah I, I mean the, the the process as I as I depicted it is fully, um, uh, runs on the same information, right? I, I clear the, uh, the D minus two capacity forecast or the base case with the same availability and demand time series as the, as the, as the day ahead and the D minus zero redispatching, which, um, which, which then in turn should already include the correct forecast, right? I don't have the uh, induced problem of forecast errors in, in itself. Okay, so the, Okay, so you don't have uncertainty actually. So the actual redispatch really comes out of 
inherent errors in the flow is not controlled. It's, it, and, I, would, and I would not. One other question, just for clarification, you're all, are you only listing the cost of cross border redispatch or also intra zonal redispatch? All, all redispatch, yeah. All, ah, all redispatch. okay. So some of it is just autonomous yeah. to the size and the shape of the zones. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it, it it's it's not necessarily a, it's maybe it's a flaw of zonal market market coupling right. where um, where it's 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 oblivious to to um, what happens inside the zone or it or the ability to kind of account for it is 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 limited. It's it's interesting to compare this also to to nodal nodal reference cases um, right. because. Um, then it's 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 obvious that the nodal solution finds or the nodal pricing finds way more effective solutions or efficient solutions um, with 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 very different resulting uh, commercial exchange or cross border flows that that will not be possible through uh, through a, either a static NDC or a, 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 a higher dimensional flow based domain. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a, but it's in your analysis, flow, I think yeah. you need to, well, I mean, to, to an extent, we're just going to have more redispatch costs as long as we have the same zonal definitions, regardless of how good the cross-zonal exchanges yeah. are organized. Yeah. But they kind of influence your results in the sense that, yeah, if you, if you keep having large zones and you put in more renewables, you get more redispatch. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's, there's nothing you can do about that except make the zones smaller or shift to nodal. The, the 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 main advantage like just from a so we're, we're stripping away the the whole body of parameterization and and the complexness complexiveness or the complexity of the system the inherent benefit of the flow based uh, method is that there is some inherent counter trading included so the 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 static net transfer capacities would allow um, a, 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 or I mean, uh, constrain bidirectional commercial exchanges, and with the flow-based method, there is an, a relief, or at least a, a combination of of commercial exchanges that, or the commercial exchanges influence each other. So, for example, um, the commercial exchange capacities from Germany to France is influenced by the commercial exchange to 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 and from um, right. Netherlands, and but. The, the, it is. It is as I also also alluded in the in the in the beginning section. It's it's a very much up to discussion the effectiveness of this. And um, again, like choosing good entities, it's it's absolutely possible to choose good entities. But um, it's very difficult then to convey it in a maybe a concise um, formulation. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you also to the other speakers. Valid, uh, Edson, and Adrian. Um, yeah, this wraps up the session. And um, yeah, I, I thank you for the attendance to the extent that they're still here. Uh, yeah, and I think I, we, we can close with this. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. And maybe sometime we'll meet in person. So. <laughs>